Welcome back to the Quantum Connection Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Vanessa Baldwin, with my co-host, Heather Crimson. And today we have a fantastic guest. We have Justine Stanger, who is amazing. You should definitely give her a follow on Instagram. I love just literally, I'm just telling her how much I watch just all of her reels like and binge them because they were just amazing. So uh, anyway, Justine received her degree from the University of Alberta in nutrition and physical science. She proceeded to pursue holistic nutrition and is a therapeutic chef. That's awesome. She has a certification in that from Bauman College and is certified health coach in functional medicine as well and is completing training through, uh, yes, the Functional Medicine Institute. And her expertise is in cell membrane medicine and has over 10 years of clinical experience working along Dr. Bruce Hoffman. So Justine, welcome to the podcast. Okay. Thank you. So happy to be here. So let's start off, Justine. And we always like to ask to get a sense of who you are and how you came into this space of your journey. Like what got you started on this path into quantum medicine? Oh my goodness. My path was not linear. That is for sure. Uh, I started, I mean, my bio kind of tells a little bit of the story. I started just a very conventional centralized education at the university of Alberta. I originally thought that I wanted to be a dietitian, but quickly jumped ship and (laughs) was much more interested in the healing aspects of food, understanding how food could be used as medicine, I was super interested in spices and all the medicinal properties that spices um, have. And so that was really, I I basically finished my degree. I ended up getting an education degree actually, uh, because I was like, what is, what is the fastest way for me to get out of here at this point? (laughs) I have switched faculty so many times I was in nursing and I was in, um, you know, nutrition. And so It was really that that led me to Bowman College in Colorado. I did the holistic nutrition therapeutic chef program there. And then when I came back to Calgary, I got connected with Dr. Bruce Hoffman, who is an integrative medical doctor. His his work is incredible. He works through seven different levels and layers and really integrates all this quantum. I mean, he was integrating the quantum stuff before it was really even like a whole field of, of science. And so it was really just understanding um, through seeing his patients and learning, you know, from him over the years that led me to studying phospholipids and fatty acids, uh, which I, you know, I'm still super, super passionate about helping people to understand how we can support the foundation of our health using uh, really, you know, lipidomics uh, to support redox potential with targeted phospholipid and fatty acid therapy. So I studied with a mentor for about six years and took all of her courses um, that she actually only offered to medical doctors at the time, but I was able to take those courses because of my relationship with Dr. Hoffman. And then I have just kind of, it's just grown from there. I mean, I've become super, super interested in understanding light and circadian biology Uh, And then as you dive into that and all these pathways that are activated by sunlight and, and earthing and how we get electrons and make antioxidants from connecting with the earth, I just become so in love with helping educate people um, around understanding how we can connect back to net nature and the power that that has in leveraging our health. And I really think that that is the key to a healthy, you know, health span and longevity, uh, is the, you know, the quantum aspect of health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a little bit about my, my journey. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I agree the whole, you know, circadian biology, quantum biology, it is literally the foundation to health. And, you know, Heather and I both have our own healing journey experiences that prove that, right. So it's so imperative. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, with the basics, like how do we support hel- cellular health? How do we support mitochondria health? Of course, on our podcast, we talk a lot about like all the things you just said, sunlight, nature, earthing, you know, quality, local seasonal organic food, avoiding toxins, non-native EMFs, artificial life, you know, all that, like, is that your foundation that you produce basically for clients as well? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, those, all those things are foundational. And, you know, Vanessa, I really feel for people who are, I feel like we're in this era of medicine where all these people are reaching for a pill, a potion, a powder, a protocol, and they think that that is the solution to their health. 
challenges. And it's, I, I feel so passionate about helping people to understand like that is never going to get you well. If you do not have the foundational principles in place, then, you know, those things are, yeah, you may be able to get some temporary relief from symptoms, but long-term that's never going to provide you with the health solution. And that's really just from understanding what do our cells need to thrive? What do the mitochondria need as essential inputs for them to stay healthy, for, for them to heal and then stay healthy? And it's really going back to, I learned so much from Dr. Robert Navio in um, understanding the health cycle and understanding, you know, pathogenesis and cell eugenesis. And we have to provide our body with those inputs that are required to restore the health cycle. Is he the um, one, Justine, who talks about the cell danger response? Mm -hmm. Yeah. His work is a cell danger response. Yeah. And how we have all these life's, life's downloads, you know, and all those life downloads are going to end up putting us in a position that where, you know, the toxic load exceeds our body's ability to maintain homeostasis. And then the mitochondria go into this cell danger response, this very primal state where they really become metabolically inactive. Mm -hmm. And if we don't restore, if we don't provide the inputs that are required to restore that health cycle, then healing is never going to occur. And we're just going to stay stuck there. Right. And all of those things that you talked about, Vanessa, you know, sunlight and grounding and EMF mitigation. And of course, food is really important and the timing of when we eat is so important. Mm -hmm. And having that, you know, optimal, we talk about sun exposure, but it's like light and dark cycles. You know, the darkness is just as important as the light and how these are the most potent signals to restore that health cycle that we could possibly give our body. So before we go reaching for, you know, a pill or a potion or a powder, those things have to be in place first and foremost. So yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Ooh, sorry. The health cycle connect to the redox. There's a, there's a, there's something similar. Are they different? Help people understand that. Well, there's three stages of the cell danger response. So there's CDR1, there's CDR2, and CDR3. So redox potential is really reduction oxidation. It's it's having good redox potential means healthy mitochondrial function, right? The, the mitochondria has a great ability to make to generate energy and make make water. And so that's like really shut down in a cell danger response. The cell really becomes meta, the mitochondria become metabolically inactive. And when we look at Dr. Doug Wallace's work. Uh, his work, I believe you may want to just check me for accuracy, but I think it is that we have to have 70% mitochondrial dysfunction before we would have mm -hmm. disease manifest. So that is the ability of the body to be able to maintain homeostasis, mm -hmm. even in these conditions that are suboptimal. And so it, you know, to, to go back to your question with redox potential, it, you would have very, very poor redox, right. When, when you're in a cell danger response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that is accurate. I've heard that. So it's like our body is pretty resilient, right? Till it reaches this certain threshold that it just can no longer, you know, and I know my body, my body actually did that. It reached a certain threshold and then it crashed and burned, you know, and you feel it and you're just like, wow, like that was it, you know, and yeah. And then, uh, you know, going back to what you said, that pill, you know, for every ill and everybody wants to take a supplement and whatnot. It's like those things just don't work. If, like you said, if you do not have the foundations in place and, that's why it's so hard, like with clients and whatnot, we have to like keep pushing them in that direction and change their paradigm, you know, because they're so used to the medical, like the allopathic traditional medical model. I go and I get this pill and everything's all better, even though it's really not. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a lot, it's a big shift. It's not only, it is a huge shift, but it's not only the allopathic centralized system model. It's also yes. the functional medicine integrative model. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I'm always saying that. And it's like, yeah, because you go and you're like a, literally a supplement for every single symptom that you have. And I'm like, how is that going to fix the problem? We know it never will. So go ahead. But they're exactly, I mean, it's in the naturopathic realm. It's in the alternative functional medicine realm, integrative medical, medical realm. And of course there's exceptions to every rule. And, and again, this is where I have been so privileged to be able to work alongside Dr. Hoffman, because yes, of course there's a time and a place for using, you know, IV protocols and supplements, but it's also making sure that the patient understands a, you have to be an active participant in your healing process. If you are not an active participant, you know, we, we see so many patients blaming, you know, they, they cast blame for not getting better. 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I can provide you with a roadmap, but I can't miraculously make you well. You have to actually implement the things that we were teaching yes. in order for you to restore that health cycle. So not that I'm against supplements. I think there's a time and a place for them when you're working with someone who understands how to use them properly and strategically. But the mentality that you can take these certain supplements to restore your health. I mean, it's completely de- delusional and it's, I mean, it, it's sad for people that don't have education and a knowledge and awareness around that, because I do think that a lot of people go into working with practitioners that are recommending these, you know, parasite cleanses or a mold detoxification protocol. Uh, they go into those experiences, assuming that they're going to get well from that protocol. Oh, no, I've been there myself. Yeah, I know you have too, Heather. <laughs> I, did the mold, I did the mold thing and uh, I mean, I had so many things I can't even remember them all. But Justine, so how do you, I'm just interested from a clinical standpoint, how do you assess or discern what angle, I mean, you want the foundation, you're going to address the basics of the quantum health circadian biology and and and, and offer that to your clients, Right. And so what do you do in, in, for example, if you think, okay, there's a lot of cell danger response activity here or presentation, and maybe there's an emotional or unresolved trauma component. Like how do you sort all that out with new clients? Hmm. Yeah. So luckily I don't always have to sort all that out because Dr. Hoffman is, uh, when I'm working with people personally outside of, of his practice, I'm really taking it, um, I, I'm, I'm addressing the health cycle, uh, through the lens of education, and then we can personalize it accordingly. Uh, I'm really, really adamant about making sure people understand that I'm, I'm not a doctor and I don't play one. (laughs) And so I'm not in the business of trying to work someone up and, you know, help, you know, give them a diagnosis or, or Mm -hmm. I can give them insight into what I think could potentially be going on. And then ultimately, My goal for people is I want to educate you so that you understand what the body needs to heal. I want to empower you with knowledge and education so that you can be your own patient advocate and ultimately learn how to become your own doctor. And of course, there's exceptions to that rule. We have emergency medicine, which I'm incredibly grateful for, but I want people to know that they really have a massive ability to control the trajectory of their health. And so- That's, you know, where I I come from and also uh, bringing into that, you know, a lot of people perceive the phospholipids and the fatty acids that I talk so much about body bio's amazing product line as supplements. And that's where I really am so adamant about helping people to understand that these are essential nutrients. These are not supplements. These are essential nutrients that, that the body requires to have healthy cells. And there's a whole field of research around that called lipidomics, where we know that using lipid replacement therapy, providing these invaluable phospholipids and fatty acids to the body helps to improve redox potential. Yeah. And is it the case, sorry, to, sorry, Vanessa, I'm, I know I'm asking more questions, but no. is it the case, Justine, that those are not available through proper nutrition? Mm-hmm. I personally think because of the level of toxicity that is in the world today and the role that phosphatidylcholine specifically plays in detoxification, I do believe in using therapeutic super physiological doses. And I have seen over the last decade or more now on lab tests, we run this really advanced test out of Germany called the IGL, where you can, it's basically depicting Dr. Robert Navio's work. You can see everything that's happening on a mitochondrial level. And so when two of the, of the characteristics of the cell danger response are when ATP goes outside of the cell and the DNA goes outside of the cell. Mm -hmm. And on that test, we can see these intracellular toxins become covalently bonded to um, either our mitochondrial DNA or our nuclear DNA. And those are called DNA addicts. And over the years, I've seen that just using phosphatidylcholine or the body biophospholipid complex, we can actually naturally remove those DNA addicts. We can remove those intracellular toxins just because of the characteristic of phosphatidylcholine that it actually has the ability 
to work its way inside the cell and to, to clear these toxins, to convert fat soluble toxins to water soluble toxins so that we can eliminate them from the body. So how amazing is that, that we have this essential nutrient that provides us with this incredible ability to detoxify and it supports, you know, when we look at redox, speaking of redox, well, the electron transport chain sits on the phosphatidylethanolamine membrane. Mm. And then we have the cardiolipin that the phosphatidylethanolamine membrane actually synthesizes that phospholipid bilayer that's very specific to the mitochondria where complex one, complex three, and complex four sit. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't have healthy membranes, how are we supposed to generate energy and make water? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So cool to learn about. I have to go read more on it, Justine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to learn about it. And you, I was listening to another podcast by you just recently, and it said, you said something about how you can actually generate those fatty acids in sunlight. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. How does that happen? At least, or did I misunderstand you? Uh, generate the, the, so the fatty acids, the essential fatty acids are essential. We have mm -hmm. to, we have to uh, consume those. Okay. Uh, so I don't know what reel you watched. I'd have to <laughs> go back and watch it. Yeah, maybe. And, and we can synthesize a lot of nutrients from sunlight. And that those studies have been done. Actually, speaking of the, the water code, this book that I've been reading, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Carly actually speaks about studies that have been done specifically on soil with different wavelengths of light. Uh, mm -hmm. The soil is exposed to different wavelengths of light. And uh, I may be I, I may not be remembering this a hundred percent accurately, but I, as, as far as I can remember, it was when you shine green light on the soil, the soil mm -hmm. has higher levels of nitrogen. When you <laughs> shine yellow light on the soil, the soil makes, you see, you see higher levels of magnesium. So mm -hmm. the microbiome of the soil actually changes based right. on the, the light exposure. Yes. I've heard that before. That is so cool. It's like, that's amazing. Right really interesting stuff. Yeah. And that's where I would say people that have nutritional deficiencies, you have a sunlight deficiency. A hundred percent. Let's yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally agree with that statement. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's, do you want, do you want to shift into leptin? Cause I'm curious to chat with somebody about that and you seem to have a good grasp on it. So do you want to tell us a little bit about leptin's function in the body? Yeah, I would love to. So leptin okay, awesome. is most people think of leptin as kind of an energy regulator from a weight standpoint, right? So we think about leptin resistance and obesity, low levels of leptin and maybe anorexia or low body weight. But leptin is actually our master hormone. So when we think about a lot of these downstream hormones like progesterone and estrogen and testosterone, uh, it's really about optimizing leptin to optimize all those other hormones, even insulin. You know, we talk a lot about insulin resistance and type two diabetes. Well, leptin resistance comes before insulin resistance. So leptin is our master kind of hormone and it can be regulated by optimizing light exposure. Uh, meal timing becomes really critical when it comes to optimizing leptin. And so that is a, a foundational um, thing that I teach as well is, you know, the leptin prescription, which is based off of uh, Dr. Jack, Jack Cruz's work. I think he was the very first person that really brought leptin on the map and then understanding how leptin activates pomp C and how pomp C, you know, in the hypothalamus is going to cleave into all of those different peptides. And we see that pom C is involved in, in energy metabolism, it is involved in immune function, it is involved in gut health, it is involved in our brain health and neurogenesis. So we have, you know, that's where you start to see, oh my gosh, the body is so interconnected. And when we can implement these circadian biology principles and we can support ourselves with, with optimal nutrition, including phospholipids and fatty acids, we can, you know, the, the ability for the body to heal. I feel, I, I personally think that the body has this amazing, miraculous ability to heal when we give it those inputs that are required. Yeah, it does. Right. So we need to optimize our leptin, our cortisol, our melatonin, and then all the other hormones will just kind of call into sync. Right. 
Um, so, and that's, yeah. that's Vanessa with, with morning light exposure, uh, sunrise UVA specifically is really, really important, um, uh, for, you know, activating, um, well, su supporting cortisol, getting that really nice cortisol peak in the morning so that we have a nice cortisol curve. And then at night, when we block all forms of artificial light, we have darkness and cortisol is low and our melatonin uh, peaks. Then leptin can dock into the hypothalamus between about 12 and two and kind of act as an accountant to let the brain know what all the 70 trillion cells in the body are doing. Uh, so yeah, that those are three markers, speaking of lab tests, that I think are so important to check, to have your leptin checked and then do a uh, melatonin cortisol. Yeah. You can do a 24 hour. Um, yeah. And you can also see them too from symptoms, right? As well, like what's going on with those as well. But yeah, so if you're not blocking artificial light at night and you're up and you're eating, you're going to be, you know, upping the cortisol, your leptin's not going to dock to the hypothalamus. And this, all these hormones, just that alone, just being in artificial light and eating late at night is going to mess with all three of those hormones and then the rest of your hormones downstream. So it's like, it's a simple thing that all of us, you know, I mean, I used to do it, you know, now I don't, but there was a time in my life that I did that we do that we don't even realize are just making this huge like quantum effect on our body. Right. So, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to be annoying, but I want to ask a question, Justine, what do you think of those cultures that eat so late at night? They're eating like at 10 o'clock at night. How do they survive? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know that's, that's, in, that's actually really interesting. I've had, I've had this question from a number of people yeah. uh, because I'm such a huge proponent of eating early. I actually like the people that I work with to eat dinner five hours before they go to bed. Uh, and sometimes we have to work up to that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, that, that question, I, I think when it comes to like a lot of these cultures are so steeped in community and connection and, you know, they're eating with their family. And so I don't think that all these things are just like A plus B equals C. Uh, I do think that there's other factors that go into that, but uh, we know just from, you know, understanding leptin and understanding melatonin that eating late at night is, would be contraindicated for everyone because it's yeah. going to impact, um, it's going to impact those hormones. A hundred percent. And I just, I, I love that you, that community connection part is so important for the human race and just for people in general like that. Okay. So maybe if you're eating circadianly, you know, perfect, but then you're never eating with anybody and never sharing meals and cooking with anybody that also can be a detriment to you. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, it doesn't always have to be that way, but it's also important to connect with people and share meals with people and enjoy that experience with them. So that's the emotional component. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's huge. You know, I read a study about that. It was years ago now, and it was a study done on a group of people that ate this organic, locally grown salad in isolation versus another group of people that were eating like this really like a, a Italian dinner, like pasta and pizza and bread in community. Mm. And the inflammatory markers postprandial were higher in the group of people that ate their meal in isolation. Yeah, that makes sense though. <laughs> it does, right? It's really important. Connection is is huge. We have to put it up way higher than we realize for healing. So yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's actually one of the inputs when you look at Dr. Robert Navio's work around the cell danger response. That is one of the inputs that are required for the body to heal. And that's, you know, one of the things that really seems scary with this whole transition to everything being online, all the social mm -hmm. media, yep. you know, people connecting over um, the yes. internet versus actually in person. Mm -hmm. yes. right, so yeah. it's a health hazard in many ways, and people might only think of it as a sedentary one. And then if you learn about this quantum biology, there's the blue light and the radiation, the non-native EMFs, but there's such a huge, much deeper impact as far as in who we are as relational beings and how we're wired to connect and the need to be witnessed and received and have that interaction energetically with a living, breathing human in front of you. You can't replace that with the, with the computers and the screen. Even when you look at the research around the electromagnetic field that the heart um, gives right. and, you know, we we're impacted by these people that we spend time with um, through, you know, that heart connection as well. So yeah, there's so many branches to all of it. And I'm sure that, 
you know, I, I know, you know, so little about that whole, this whole field compared to many, but I'm sure there's so much that we just don't even really understand about how all these different things impact our health. Yeah. There's always so much to learn. Right. And that's like exactly what your journey was, right. How you kept growing, right. And learning and expanding it. So, yeah, I want to go back to leptin again and chat about leptin and thyroid, if that's okay. Can we go there a little bit? So how did those two things play a role? You know, how is leptin really, I know it's um, a big part of controlling the thyroid, right? So can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I, I actually just did a post on this a little while ago where, you know, hypothyroidism, um, and there's going to be exceptions to the rule, but my understanding that the majority of cases of hypothyroidism are going to be directly linked to leptin resistance yep. uh, because you've lost that ability to regulate, you know, to regulate energy. And I use the analogy often um, of if you were to go in your car and you didn't have a gas gauge, you had no idea how much gas was in the tank. Would you go on, you know, a, a long road trip and drive for three hours? Because, you know, you, you wouldn't, you're going to stop. You're, you're a, probably not going to go anywhere because you don't know how much gas is in the tank, but there's no way that you're going to go like a long distance. Right. And the, the body is the same when there's leptin resistance, it works in a very similar fashion. And so we see this downregulation of thyroid hormone and actually reverse T3, a high reverse T3 is a really good marker for identifying leptin resistance as well. If you haven't done a leptin, right. Um, that's, that's a, a sign that there's some leptin resistance, but yeah, there, I mean, it's intimately connected to that, mm -hmm. even just through that whole pathway. Like when you look at um, the pump C, the hypothalamus is regulating the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. And so, and leptin is docking in the hypothalamus. Leptin is activating pump C. So that whole pathway is connected. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. So now, what do you think about then, like low leptin versus high leptin, and what do you, you know, what do you think about those two? Is that the, is it really the same thing, the same dysfunction? Is there, is it you do you treat it differently clinically or the same? So I personally look at those levels, low leptin uh, and high leptin as kind of two of the same, but on op opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I would still recommend the leptin prescription for people that have low levels of leptin with a few adjustments. So with someone who has leptin resistance, I am going to want to move them to those longer periods of fasting after a certain amount of time. So we want to, you know, focus on eating a protein and fat rich meal, first meal of the day, as close as we can to the sun rising. So we want to pair that light in our eyes with um, that big meal, big meal in the morning. And then we want to make sure that there's nothing but water, you know, between meals. And we're going at least four or five hours between meals. And then for someone with leptin resistance for the first stage, I would say early dinner, uh, but still we can focus on three meals a day to kind of help to support regulating leptin. Uh, and then with leptin resistance after, you know, six, eight weeks of doing that, I'm going to encourage people to try to skip dinner a couple times a week so that we can get in that longer fasting period. Mm -hmm. That would be um, not recommended for an individual that has low leptin. I would wanna keep them consistent with those three meals a day until we can optimize leptin. And then once they've optimized leptin, of course, that they can, they can bring in those longer fasting periods. But the dietary principles are still the same. It's still a really big protein-rich, fat-rich breakfast, nothing in between meals, uh, and this is where it gets tricky, like helping people to understand that things like stevia in their electrolyte formula uh, oh, that all day is going to impact leptin. And so it's really, you know, a re-education around what giving our, our body like life giving water looks like. Um, it doesn't mean adding all kinds of powders <laughs> to our water and, and then, um, and then of course, with low leptin, the carbohydrate restriction with leptin resistance is gonna be a little bit different with low leptin. So with leptin resistance, I really encourage people to stay around 25 grams of carbs or less per day. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course that's taking into account seasonal uh, principles around eating too. So in the summer, you know that, that might mean going up to about 50 grams depending on where somebody is in their health journey. 
Um, and then in the winter, that might be no carbs because it's just following a carnivore diet, depending on where you live. And then somebody with low levels of leptin, I, I probably wouldn't recommend that low of carbohydrates until we can get um, leptin to a healthier level. But I do recommend loading those carbs at um, the first part of the day. So at breakfast, ideally, and to kind of staying between 25, 30 grams of carbs uh, with protein and fat, and then having small amounts of carbs at lunch, and then having a very, very low carbohydrate dinner. And again, eating dinner as early as possible. Yeah. Very similar prescriptions for both low leptin and high leptin. And then of course the light is, you know, making sure that we're getting morning sunlight and as much of it as possible and getting light throughout the day and blocking, you know, all forms of artificial light. I'm, I'm in the camp that I never think it's good to get any artificial, you know, blue light from computers and phones. A lot of people will say it's fine during the day. We just don't want those exposures at night. I, I don't subscribe to that because mm -hmm. the nanometers of light that we're getting from our phone and from our computer are completely unnatural. We would never get those in nature. And so I always recommend uh, making sure that we're, we're blocking those forms of light. That was, yeah. yeah, that's a good segue into light, Justine, mm -hmm. what are you using right now on your computer? Do you have the, the orange film on it on the screen or what do you use? Yeah. So I use Iris yes, um, on my computer and it's always pretty orangey yellow. Uh, and then at night I use the red. If yeah. I have to, work at night, I, I just use the red screen. And then I always add, uh, you can see here my near infrared uh, lights. So those are in my room, you know, the whole day that I'm working. And I also always keep a window open as well. Yeah. Awesome. Similar to what I do. I have mine on Iris too. And I just, I just keep it on red, but yeah, when we're looking at those, you know, the screens on, you know, from our phones or from our computer screens, you know, it's literally telling our body that it's noon in June 24 seven. And that is really dysregulating. So yeah, always open the windows. Iris is cheap guys. It's only $14. Like, and you get it for life. So just like, it's such a quick, easy fix, you know? And sometimes when I recommend it to clients, they're like, wait a minute, it's going to be red like yours all the time. I'm like, no, I'm like, you can switch it. Like you can put it in custom mode. You can make it more orange. Like it doesn't have to be like red, red, but you can see some color sometimes, but <laughs> it's really important. Like for your health, it's a simple, it's such a simple tack. Like really. <laughs> Williams. Yeah. If people, most people just need to get, get used to it. I mean, it's the same thing on my phone. Uh, I always yeah. recommend you change the, the screen on their phone to red and yeah, it's, you're not going to see color like you typically would when the screen is blue, but yeah. I think it's just really important to focus on, well, how is this impacting my health? And, 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 you know, speaking of being non-judgmental about where people are at in their health journey, if people are informed and they have the information, and they understand the consequences, then fine. If they want to keep their screen blue, if they you don't want to use Iris, then I'm totally fine with that. Uh, I just want to really make sure people understand, you know, yeah. and, and can weigh out those benefits and, and risks. Yeah. So yeah. they can be empowered and make their own choices. And then that's the self-responsibility that we need to have to really heal is to know as much as we can understand how our bodies work, and then we can make choices. But then we also have to write, accept the consequences of those. There's always going to be a consequence, but. Exactly. But, you know, I, I've really learned this over the years too. And, and this has largely um, been because of uh, Dr. John D. Martini's work and really understanding values and how we all have like our own hierarchy of values and not everybody has health as their highest value or in, you know, the highest category of values. And so those are the people that are going to make excuses for mm -hmm. everything. And it's really understanding that a, you know, hopefully we can try to transition if health is at a lower value to a higher value by trying to connect it to something that is a, of a higher value, but some people, you just can't do that. And that's, that's okay. There's no judgment in that. It's just understanding that, There'll, there'll be consequences, just like there are consequences for everything that we do. Yeah. I wish people didn't have to hit rock bottom to get them to make their health a priority. And sometimes that is what happens, you know? So 
Yeah. And sometimes like me, in my case, like I hit rock bottom to make my health a priority, but I thought I was making my health a priority before that, but I Mm -hmm. wasn't doing it right. You know, chronic cardio and restricting fat and, you know, eating all the time, like, you know, like the small meals a day, like all these little things, you know, a lot of us are vegan. I I wasn't vegan before, but like, we think we're doing the right thing for our health, but we're just misinformed also. Right. So it's like, and then all of a sudden we have a health crisis and you're like, oh, well, maybe I wasn't doing that maybe how I should have, but yeah, it's all part of the learning curve. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think a lot of times it's really unlearning things that we have learned in the past that we were told are good for us Mm -hmm. and adopting you know, new, new things. And I had the very, I had the same experience as you. It's, you know, I went through years of my life with chronic symptoms, fatigue and brain fog, and, you know, just feeling like depression and feeling like I was doing everything, you know, and questioning, why do I feel like this? I feel like I'm doing everything that I can. And of course I had thousands of dollars of supplements in my supplement cupboard, And I was taking all the things, but I wasn't doing any of the things that are foundational. I wasn't getting my feet on the earth. I wasn't watching the sunrise. I wasn't spending time outside. I wasn't, you know, understanding the, that we are a body of water and what are all of the things that we can do to help support the structure of that beautiful crystal water in our bodies. Um, that is really acting like a battery in our cell, you know, speaking of cellular health and using, you know, phospholipids and fatty acids to support our membrane. Um, But how are we supporting our mitochondria's ability to make water and then structuring that beautiful water in our cells? So. Absolutely. So that's where we come into the importance like you've mentioned already, Justine, of how that morning light, it's essential to get your eyes and hopefully skin as much as possible as it warms up to expose to those signals in the morning. Those frequencies of light are what inform our brain, our bodies in in the order of operations. Like this is what we need to do now. And this is what um, hormones we need to increase. And all of that is in concert with the light frequencies, the blend of light frequencies that we are basically taking in in the morning, like a nutrient, right? But if people unfortunately have to get up um, and go to work in the winter when it's dark and then they are in the summer, they're wearing sunglasses. So there's all these modern living hazards that compromise our body's ability to um, take in the light. It, I mean, civilized living is a problem for sure. And then the, the way that we've structured our day, I mean, I feel incredibly grateful to be in a position where I do have the ability to curate my day according to the way that I want. And I can fit in these, these behaviors that are so imperative for health. But I, I also, you know, I understand that not everybody is able to do that perfectly, but everybody is able to put on a pair of red lens glasses when they get up in the morning before, if they have to go to work early and make sure they're not getting blue light in their eye and getting outside as soon as the sun rises, even if it's five minutes once they get to the office and taking off those glasses and getting, you know, their naked eyes in the sun. That is accessible. What is that going to do for them? The people need to know the essence of why that's important. How, how do you tell people what that is? Well, that is, you know, that is, orchestrating, we have about a hundred thousand different biochemical reactions that's happening within the cell every second. And your body can't look at your cell phone or the clock on the wall to tell what time it is. The only way that your body has the ability to know what to do and when to do it is by sinking your naked eyes with the sun. And that is, is the power that comes from understanding how important it is to get that signal. And if there was one thing that people did for their health, I would say that is the most important thing because of what we know that you are, if we do not get that signal in, you are now creating a scenario in your body where you do not know what to do and when to do it. And that creates chaos systemically wide. Yeah. So. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> couldn't agree more. hundred percent. It's literally light is the number one zeitgeber. It is the way our body tells time. And we know we are in time and space and it it's an orchestra. It tells our body what to do and when to do it. And that's why we need to send the right signals to our body on a daily basis, a consistent daily basis really is what the key is. Yeah, absolutely. Consistency is so key. 
And this is also something that I really feel so important to emphasize is it's those little tiny behavior changes that we make every single day that are ultimately going to change the trajectory of our health. It's not the, you know, once every once in a while, when you have dinner at 10 PM, because you're you know traveling or you're with friends, it's going to, that a lot of people get hung up on, right. Mm -hmm. When they're type A personality and wanting to do everything perfectly. It's like, just implement these little things that we can do every single day. And then, you know, the one-off things that we do, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. And as we improve, like even with, you know, leptin is a perfect example. As we improve leptin, then we have so much more wiggle room. Of course, we don't want to kind of like fall off the wagon. But then, you know, if we have, if we're, you know, in a situation where we can't have that big protein and and fat rich breakfast, pairing that with a sunrise one morning, and we end up eating breakfast at 11 o'clock, it's not going to derail us, right? Whereas we don't have that wiggle room if we're left in resistant. We have to make sure that we provide our body with those signals like on point day after day after day. That consistency is really key. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So let's talk a little bit about diet. Like what would you say like is the best optimal diet for cellular health? I mean, Heather and I talk all about, of course, the seasonal, the local, organic, all the things buying from Junior Farms. And are you on the same page with that? I am. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, people ask me all the time, well, what kind of diet, what do you eat? (laughs) Because what I eat is going to be different uh, than what you would be eating, depending on where you live. Right. And so if you're in Costa Rica, then eat all the mangoes and all the papayas you want. Uh, But when you're in Alberta in the middle of winter, you know, that's an inflammatory signal which is hard for people to wrap their head around. I think, especially when you live at a place, it's a high latitude and nothing is growing where you're living for eight months of the year. And the mentality is, well, we need fiber and we need fruits and vegetables. (laughs) The blueberries give us all the antioxidants. I'm like, well, actually (laughs) they may be a little bit inflammatory for you in, in December, right? So yeah, okay. And it really goes back to that food is photosynthesis. Right. And so food gets broken down into electrons and protons and those electrons are going to enter the electron transport chain. So it's not a protein, fat and carbohydrate transport chain. Right. And so, and those electrons we know now carry those bio photons and those bio photons are created by the relationship that that food had with the sun. So we have this beautiful electromagnetic barcode that's on the food that we eat. And so if we're eating a banana in the middle of January in Canada, that is a mismatch. And ultimately when we consume foods that are a mismatch, that's going to cause inflammation. So it's just, again, speaking of unlearning, I mean, for me having a nutrition background, (laughs) this is like, okay, that was a complete waste of time, like a complete waste of time. That's why I like, I was, I was so contemplated, like going to nutrition school when I was, you know, going through my health crisis. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to go to nutrition school. And then I started learning this. And I was like, well, that's probably going to be uh, not even important, really. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, hundred percent. But it's the, it's understanding that food is not just energy; it's information, right? That's like the big key component that you have to kind of grasp. And it also goes back to like ancestrally, what would we have done like at back in the day, well, before we had chronic disease? And it's not just, of course, just the food we're eating; it's everything in our environment. Our environment is really, you know, epigenetics turning on our gene expression, right? So it's not just that, but it wasn't available. Like the banana wasn't available in Alberta a couple hundred years, whatever, a hundred years ago, right? It, it didn't, it didn't, wasn't possible, right? And now we have all these possibilities due to, you know, you know, we can export foods from everywhere. Yeah, it's just, it's makes it hard for people to grasp that because of the modern world that we live in. It's just abundance. It's always summer, right? What was that amazing book I read, right? I love that book. Like it's always summertime for us. Yeah. And, and it always, always feast and never famine. Yes. And so really making sure that people understand that it's, we want cycles with all, I mean, even just when we look at our microbiome and how it changes with the UV um, intensity. Yes. yes. So it, you, you can't, you know, you can't deny that evidence and then say, well, I should be having my smoothie with blueberries every morning, my protein shake with blueberries every morning, all year round. 
you know, it's just, um, it, again, it's, it's unlearning and then relearning new information. And the thing is too, with, with the dietary stuff, it's really tricky because people end up adopting diet, like a religion. And they also, of course, I mean, Heather, you would be the perfect person to speak to this, that food is not just information. Food is like connection and food has like, there's an emotional component to, you know, why we choose to eat what we eat, um, trauma, you know, whatever, there's lots of branches to food. And so to tell somebody all of a sudden that lives in Canada, like you are just going to eat local, you're going to find a local farmer and you are going to eat four-legged animals, beef, lamb, <laughs> bison, and fish over the course of the, and eggs over the course of the winter. It's like, it's hard. you know, people, I get so much pushback with that because people are yeah. like, well, what about, I'm not, how am I getting any antioxidants? And I'm, how am I going to go to the bathroom? I don't have any fiber and I can't just eat meat. Like that's, I don't enjoy eating anymore. And then they're gonna say, what about my cholesterol? And then <laughs> so, yeah, I know we get the same questions too, but it's like, yeah, a hundred percent. But yeah, it's, I love that the emotional component is there too. And yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. And they got to have their dessert or, you know, like I get it. Like I get it. People are, yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think that I have, um, I, I have a lot of growth in that area as well, because I'm so like, I live and breathe what I teach. I'm so yes. passionate about this. I want everybody to be as passionate as I am about it. And so it's hard when you're, you know, working with someone that's not there to make sure that you actually have the tools to, to meet them where they're at and you're not, you know, pushing them into a territory where they're completely uncomfortable with. Yeah. And then also, you know, looping in with the diet stuff, um, this is where, you know, I always recommend the body biophospholipid complex and the balance oil to make sure that we're supporting those two essential fatty acids that so many people, you know, forget are essential nutrients and the consequences of not consuming adequate amounts and optimal ratios of essential nutrients as disease and death that I did learn in nutrition school. And so, you know, avoiding these things or not uh, really making sure that we're providing those for ourselves is, is detrimental for our health. And again, body bio does an amazing job of providing pure functional forms of these phospholipids and fatty acids. So those are always incorporated as well. That sounds like a long-term protocol. Like I'm taking those right now and the sodium butyrate and, you know, it's hard to really feel into, is this actually doing something? So people ask that question, like, I can't really tell it's not this dramatic change, but I think if you're literally um, transforming the architecture of your cells, that it's more of a long-term process, right? Yeah. You know, Heather, I get that all the time. And I think that this is, the, I have a really hard time understanding it because I think that people just have this mentality that they're going to take something and feel different. Mm -hmm. And so I usually use the example of how would you feel if you ate 12 egg yolks in one day? Mm -hmm. Like, would you feel, I mean, maybe people that can't digest and assimilate fats would feel nauseous. <laughs> But if that wasn't an issue, I mean, you're not going to feel any different by it, long-term you will absolutely long-term you will when you start to provide your body with the information that it needs to, because that's an input. And we know that from Dr. Robert Navio's work, we need optimal amounts of macronutrients. That's why, you know, doing all these crazy fasting and calorie restrictive diets is completely and totally contraindicated if you want to restore your cellular health, but we also need optimal amounts of these micronutrients. So those are inputs. And so we, as we, we include these phospholipids and fatty acids, it takes six months to a year to restore mitochondrial function. So again, those are one input along with all these other inputs that are required. And so I often say it might take you six months or, or a year to start feeling better, to start mm -hmm. feeling more energy, to have more clarity, to, you know, have less brain fog, because that is restoring mitochondrial function doesn't happen overnight. But earthing so, and getting more sunlight, many people do experience pretty quick improvements, but we're talking about deep healing right from the inside out. So it just, you, you do need all of the right inputs. It just might, certain things might affect your, um, the, the rapidity of which you recover, right? Will be different mm -hmm. for different inputs. So it's not like, you know, this one thing is going to be the thing it's do all the things and then your body will do what it needs to do along the way. And you'll notice benefits, but you may not be able to tell, well, which one is doing exactly what. 
right? It's yeah. not always that clear. And, and Heather, what you're with the, with the sunlight exposure and the darkness at night, that whole like light dark um, uh, routine is you're, you can fix circadian biology in three, we have studies on it with camping, right? Three days, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. restore circadian biology. So that's in a bit of a different category than, you know, actually right. repairing mitochondria, but it's, intimately connected into that whole, now you've just set that set the stage for your body to know when to do what it needs to do and what to do during all those different times. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, it takes time. And I do recommend the phospholipid complex and the balance oil long-term. I, I don't like people to look at them as supplements that they take for a short period of time. Hmm. And those are really the only two things that uh, along with the you know, sodium butyrate, right? Right. Yeah. And I think Tudka can be really beneficial for people with um, cholestasis for um, really, really supportive uh, for people that have, you know, hi a history of neurodegenerative disease. Um, we know that there's so much research now that supports using Ted Tudka to reduce the stress on the endoplasmic reticulum. And there's studies showing that it helps to support mitochondrial function as well. So of course we can use, you know, a lot of these tools, um, short term or, you know, for very specific reasons, but the phospholipid complex and the balance oil are two things that I recommend as like long-term tools. Hmm. Right. Tudka is a synthetic bear bile and it actually helped me to eliminate my seasonal allergies. Now I still have histamine issues, but I'm working on that. And that's tied for me more to the cell danger response. So I'm working on it long-term and the emotional layers. So it's <laughs> all connected, like you're saying, Justine. So that's CDR1, Heather. CDR1. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, if you look up Dr. Robert Navio's paper, you'll see all the different conditions that are not that we ever want to attach ourselves to, you know, a diagnosis, but there are different conditions that are associated with each um, CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3. Hmm. We'll have to look into that and talk about that at some point, Vanessa, on the podcast because it's. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, I emailed him and invited him to be on the podcast, but I didn't hear back. So it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sure he's a busy, busy okay. man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had one last question because I heard you also say in another podcast about um, oxalate toxicity, well, oxalate sensitivity and mole, mole toxicity and how it relates to non-native EMFs. And I had that experience as well because um, I definitely noticed an uptake in my symptoms when I was around non-native EMFs and it, I had diagnosed with mold and oxalate sensitivity. So I wanted you to touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, we, we, we wired our house for ethernet and I know there's no Wi-Fi in my house at all. And we removed our smart meter and done all those things. And it's turned, you know, we used to turn the Wi-Fi off at night and all those things have been really supportive on my healing journey. Um, so just touch on that a little bit, if you don't mind, as a, as a last thing, like the non-native EMFs and how that's really, you know, impacting all these people who have mold and all these sensitivities and whatnot. Yeah. Well, I, I would honestly say that the non-native EMF, um, and blue light is included in that are the biggest yes to our mitochondrial function for sure. And now understanding, I know we had kind of a whole conversation about water before we started recording, but uh, understanding the water in our body and how we are a body of water, how these electromagnetic frequencies impact the structure of the water in our body. Um, I mean, it's, it's so devastating that we're swimming in a soup of these all day long. But as far as oxalate toxicity, I think you know, again, we, we often have been told that we just need to remove oxalate containing foods <laughs> and not to say that there, you know, isn't while we are, you know, working to restore redox potential so that we actually have the ability, um, to get, you know, break down these oxalates that can be a tool that we can use for sure. So that we're not, you know, having spinach, mm -hmm. and sweet potato, and, you know, every oxalate containing food on our plate. Uh, but ultimately it goes back to supporting redox and supporting mitochondrial function and the TCA cycle, you know? So that is a piece that's often not talked about. And when we are living in a home that has all these smart devices and mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, and we are tethered to our phone all day and, you know, Bluetooth is a really, um, a really big offender as well. That's, destroying our 
mitochondrial function. Like every single time we pick up our phone, I always say like you're dealing with a toxin. Every time you pick up your phone, you need to perceive it through that lens because that's what it is. And then we need to do everything that we can to go and, you know, collect electrons to help to support our body uh, from those, those assaults. So it really comes, I mean, it all comes back down to mitochondria. And that's not my opinion. That's, you know, for anyone to look up with Dr. Doug Wallace, who is the leading researcher, leading mitochondrial researcher. I mean, he has, I believe the statistic is between 95 and 99% of the conditions that we see today or of mitochondrial origin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all roads lead back to what are all the things that we can do to restore mitochondrial function and provide the body with those inputs that it needs for ultimate healing and health. Yeah. Those non-EMS are just dehydrating the cells and the easy water can't, you know, is not there for us anymore. So that's probably the, uh, that's a big problem, right? So you need to make sure that we're in the sunlight and earthing and, you know, doing all the things that support the mitochondria like we've discussed here. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. It's hard for people. I mean, again, if people are so addicted to technology mm -hmm. and it's, I, I try to get people to understand that we can use technology responsibly. Like, like you, I'm hardwired, you mm -hmm. know, we don't have Wi-Fi on and my phone is off all day mm -hmm. until I'm intentional about, you know, logging into Instagram to answer messages or post to post. And it's like, mm -hmm. I'm in and I'm out and then my phone goes off. Uh, but for whatever reason, um, that piece is really hard and getting phones out of people's rooms and, you know, especially with parents when they say, well, I have to have my phone on all day because I have kids and I need to be able to get in touch with. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, did you know that you can get a landline and have your cell That's phone so forward to your landline? <laughs> it's like there's lots of things that we can do, but, you know, there's a lot of resistance when making those recommendations for sure. I used to, when we used to turn the Wi-Fi off, our phone line was linked to the, was linked to the Wi-Fi so that we turn off also. So then we bought a land, like that was, it was a, dis it was a discussion. It took some time, you know, but we got a landline here. So now everything can be off. And even our whole internet connection, like the ethernet even goes off at night. Like we have a timer on it. So it's like, it's so doable. Like it took us literally a weekend it was, did it take some time? Did we have some time without internet? Yeah. But after we did it, it was like, first of all, it works faster and better, right? The connection is better because just, you're not, you're not going through the ether, you're going through the wire, right? You know, so it just works better. So um, I think when people hear that, sometimes that helps them to be like, oh, I'm going to have faster internet. Okay. Maybe that'll help me, you know, be interested and better health. Right. So and you can even, I mean, so many people don't even know that you can hardwire your phone too. You know? Yeah, I do. Yep. I hardwire my phone. That's how I use internet. Like there is no Wi-Fi in my home at all. I mean, you can use, you can use service, right? But I don't ever turn the, my phone literally is always Wi-Fi off, Bluetooth off, everything is off. And so I just connect it to my, my ethernet cable. You have to have an adapter. It's really simple. I know it's, I know it's very simple, but yeah, it's just, it just takes an adjustment period. And that's where too, I think that the most valuable thing that someone could invest in, I think, is hiring a building biologist to come mm -hmm. into their home to assess their home environment because it's not just Wi-Fi. You know, it's the electrical current and it's magnetic fields that have, I would say magnetic fields are probably the biggest assault. And so you don't feel any of that, right? You could be living in this environment that is destroying your health. And I had, I just had this experience. I mean, I have so many stories to share regarding this topic, but mm. I just had a client that I was working with, uh, recently tell me she's been so sick for a year doing all the things really committed to improving her health. And she was a like challenge because you, I mean, for me to support her, you feel so guilty. Cause I'm like, I don't know what else to recommend to this person. And she's working so hard. She's doing all the things. Mm. And she finally had a building biologist come into her house and find out that in their bedroom, they, their, the bedroom was right by beside like a major power line mm -hmm. and they had carcinogenic levels of electrical currents in her bedroom where she's sleeping every night. Mm. And it's like, wow. That's why you can't heal because every night you're being assaulted. 
So, so what did you do? What did, what was the solution? Did they? It's moving. They're moving. It's moving. Good. Yeah. Okay. There was no way to make the power it. Line. You have to move yourself. You can't move the power line. Right. There's not, I just wanted to reiterate for that for people. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing you can do. It's like that, that place should be, no one should live there. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that, that is a whole nother topic because yeah. it's really sad that that's, you know, those homes that are beside those large power lines and even power lines. I mean, there's, there's lots that we can do to mitigate things. Cause sometimes it's just a matter of like, when you hire a building biologist, you'll see that sometimes it's a matter of changing the position of your bed. And then right. the levels drop because it's, you know, all about the inverse square law. So the farther that we can get away from the source, the better it is. And these, you know, an electrical current, I think drops, you know, basically a hundred percent after six feet away or something. It's not a large distance. So sometimes it just means moving your bed to the other side of the room. Well, and that could be a simple fix, right? So if somebody gets somebody in there and they check that out, then yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. But if you don't test, then, you know, you're. You're you don't kind of know. blindly. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. Well, Justine, I know we're probably at the end here and we just yeah. want to thank you so much for your time, your wealth of knowledge, wisdom, and heart. Cause I can feel that too. Oh, well, and your generosity and, and, and um, privileging us with your, with all of your wisdom. And I can see that you're helping so many people. So any parting words of wisdom and then tell us where people can find you. Thank you. First and foremost, this was really, really lovely to be able to spend this hour with you. I would just encourage people to just start with the small things, those small little things, those little signals that they can give their body every day that are going to help signal healing. And you can find me on Instagram. That is where I'm most active. Uh, I'm at Justine Cellular Nutrition. Uh, if you want to learn more about the body bio products, uh, that's at body bio and my website is currently getting redone. Ooh, so it will soon be <laughs> justinestanger.com. Um, I think I should have that up in a week or so, but it's down right now. So that's where you can find me in the meantime on Instagram. Well, everybody go follow Justine. She's a wealth of information. You share so much freely too. Like there's just so much free content there. That's amazing. So uh, it's really a great resource for people just there. And uh, we look forward to looking at your new website and checking that out. That's exciting. And really, it's been a lovely conversation. We absolutely appreciate you coming on and just like Heather said, sharing all your wisdom. So yeah, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. My pleasure. <laughs>